You know, you know, if you tell me you're a cat, there ought to be some indications in your life that you're a cat, like a tail and uh, a bad attitude. <laughs> there's indications. You know, it's easy to say I'm this or that, but there's usually indications that will tell the the truth. Um, for for instance. And I've borrowed these from Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, if you've ever cut your grass and found a car, you might be a redneck. If someone asked to see your identification and you show them your belt buckle, you may be a redneck. If your dad walks you to school, because you're in the same grade. <laughs> you may be a redneck. Well, let's not just pick on rednecks. If you use hand gestures to talk, even when you're on the phone, you might be Italian. If you have at least three first cousins with the same first name as your grandfather, you might be Italian. There should be indications in our lives that we may actually be in the faith because especially in this part of the world, it is so easy to say, I belong to Jesus Christ. There are some objective indicators. That means those obvious, observable things in us and in others that we know that may be indicators that you really are in the faith. For instance, if we consider your relationship to Scripture, if you love God's Word, if you long to get up in the morning and to spend time, at least a portion of your day, in God's Word, if you have a growing understanding of the Bible, God's Word, and you desire to obey God's Word, you might be a Christian. And last week, we started another category of objective indicators, and that is we look at our relationship to the saints. Who are the saints? We who believe and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What is your relationship to the saints? And first up, do you love fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? And of course, we all nod our head, uh-huh, uh-huh, because we know we're supposed to. Do we really love the saints? What does the Bible say about loving the saints? What does it really mean to love the saints? And it can be kind of summed up by John in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 16. This is how we know what love is. That he, that is Jesus Christ, laid down his life for us and that we ought to be laying our lives down for the brothers. Who are the brothers? Those are the saints, brothers and sisters in Christ. What does it mean to lay your life down? Well, we know that Jesus Christ laid his life down. He died for us. Do we have to die for one another? Well, not always all the way, sometimes part of the way. And John gives an illustration. He said, starting at the end of the second line, but if anyone has the world's goods, hey man, meet me out in the parking lot. I got the goods in the trunk. Is that what he's talking about? No. If you've got a car, if you've got some money in the bank, if you have food in the pantry, if you have clothes in the closet, guess what? You got the world's goods. You may not have as many as you would like, I would like my bank account doubled, but I still have the world's goods. And if anyone does have the world's goods, he's not talking about rich people, and sees his brother in Christ in need 
and I'm going to address that word need here in just a couple seconds, sees his brother in genuine need and yet closes his heart against him, how is God's love abiding in him? It ain't. Answer is obvious. So do you love God? the brethren do you love the saints if you are not responding to needs in your brothers and sisters little children john continues let us love not in word or in speech only i can insert that word in other words it's important that we tell one another that we love one another that is important but that's not the whole picture we don't tell each other we, we don't love just in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. If you love me, show me. Remember the song we went over last week? And John says, by this, by what? If we are loving the brethren by doing things that they need, we shall know that we are of the truth and it will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us because sometimes frankly my heart condemns me when i take a good look at my life in christ i am not pleased with what i see most of the time but this is one of the things that i can look back on do i do this now, there's a few of you in here who never met Marion, but most of you in the room remember Marion, who was with us until she was killed in an automobile accident. Has Marion ever asked you for money? Really? I'm the only one? She used to come to me two or three times a month because she would have doctor's visits to pay for and whatever money I had on me. It was Marion's. I'm surprised I'm the only one that she asked. I guess she must have thought I was rich. But anyway, let me, let me move on here. What does it mean to love the saints? To respond to needs in their lives. <clears throat> now, remember I said I was going to address the word need. Because there's going to be a lot of supposed Christians that are going to ask you for money. And it may not be a good idea or even an act of love to give them money. Now, we all get in trouble sometimes because, and we need things. And sometimes that is the result of our own tomfoolery. Does that mean that we don't help them? No, we do. But we don't continue to help them forever. All right. Paul addresses the issue in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you stay away from any brother who is living in idleness. What's that mean? He ain't working. <clears throat> and it's not because he can't work. It's because he won't work. And not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. <clears throat> You know, I've heard pastors say, I, I don't tell my congregation to be like me. Well, Paul has no problem with that. Several times in his letters, he says, be like me as I am like Christ. And if a leader in the church can't say, follow me as I follow Christ, then he probably doesn't deserve to be a leader. Now, I don't want you to be like me in all respects because I am not... I haven't got it all together. But Paul has no problem saying, imitate me. We were not idle when we were with you. He didn't spend a whole lot of time in Thessalonica. But while he was there, he was working his tail off and ministering. We did not eat anyone's bread without pain. But with toil and labor, we worked day and night so that we might not be a burden to any of you. Does anybody remember what Paul did for a profession to earn himself some money? He was a tent maker, okay? Which meant maybe that he also worked in leather and provided shoes or sandals and, and things like this. But he did that 
rather than going into a town that had never heard of Jesus Christ and say, okay, now you got to pay me for that information. Now, it was not because we do not have that right, because, and Paul will cover this over in 1 Corinthians, those who preach the gospel should get their living by the gospel. In other words, they shouldn't have to work an outside job. But Paul did not make use of that right, and especially when he was in Thessalonica, he worked to show them an example, to give you in our conduct an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. If anyone will not work, it doesn't mean he can't work, he will not work, then he must not eat. In other words, you as the church in Thessalonica quit subsidizing these loafers. And that's what Paul is saying. We should give to people who are in genuine need, even if they unwisely got themselves in trouble. All right? I'm not saying that we don't help people who make mistakes, but I'm just saying we don't perpetuate that. We don't enable them to continue in that lifestyle. Paul finishes up with this, for we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. So what does it mean to love the saints? Well, you got to consider both aspects of that. Do you love the saints? Love covers a multitude of sins. Um, hatred stirs up strife, according to Proverbs 10, verse 12, but love covers all offenses. Folks, when somebody does you wrong in the church, and if they haven't yet, don't blink because it's eventually going to happen because Christians are not perfect. Christians are going to disappoint you. They're going to do and say the wrong thing. And you could just hate them and not forgive them. And you'd be quick to run over to your neighbor. Do you know what Joe did to me? But love seeks to cover that up so that other people don't think badly of the person that offended you. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter 4.8. Above all, hold unfailing your love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. There are going to be things that people do against us that are going to hurt our feelings, uh, that are going to make us angry. They're going to feel like betrayal to us. It is easy to want to get our pound of flesh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But a lot of this stuff can just be let go. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if one of you has a grievance with a brother, why is he going to, to make a big court case out of it? Why not just suffer the wrong? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Forbearing one another. You know what that means? Let's put that in today's language. Putting up with one another. Because people... There are going to be people in the congregation who are going to needle you. They feel that it's their job. <laughs> no, Randy, this is not aimed at you. <laughs> Quit raising your hand back there. <laughs> okay. You know, you know what I mean? And 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 they're just they just are aggravating. And if but we need to put up with one another because this is what it means to love the saints because love covers a multitude of sins. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving one another. If somebody does you wrong, you've, you've got a number of choices. You can say, I forgive it. That, that, that's just Joe. Or you can make a, a, a case out of it and get everybody involved. 
As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Okay, so love covers a multitude of sins. Now, sometimes sins uh, are committed against us or even against the church that need to be addressed. For instance, if, if someone attacks my wife, that's a serious sin. I can't just sit there in my recliner and say, honey, let's just get over it. <laughs> you know, why not rather suffer wrong? There are serious sins that need to be addressed. And in Matthew chapter 18, we have a process that we go through when somebody wrongs us. If a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. It tries to keep the brother's sin concealed as much as possible because we can be a help to our brother or sister in getting over this sort of thing and repenting. If your brother does not listen to you, if it's a minor offense, you can just say, fine, I, I forgive you. Or if it's something major, then it probably needs to be addressed for the sake of you, for the sake of the person who did the sin, and for the sake of the congregation of Jesus Christ. And we had such a situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among the unbelieving world, for a man has his father's wife. That's, that's pretty nasty, isn't it? And you are arrogant. You're proud that you can put up with this in your congregation. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you because the purity of the bride of Christ is of first importance to the Lord Jesus Christ, her husband, and it ought to be of first importance to us. So there are certain things that we can't just sweep under the carpet and say, oh, that's just Joe. These are certain things that we need to take care of. But since love covers a multitude of sins, we try as much as possible to keep this concealed as long as possible, giving the person an opportunity to repent. Do you love the saints? Brotherly love is affectionate. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9, Paul says, Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Now, the, the Greeks have at least four Greek words for love. And two of them are found in this verse. The, the first there, love one another, is the agape love. The other three kinds of love are motivated by our emotions about how we feel about somebody. The agape love is motivated by need that it sees. You remember my the story I told you a number of weeks ago about that dishwasher that we all hated at the restaurant where I worked as a kid. And uh, I ended up saving his life with the Heimlich maneuver. I was not motivated to save his life because I loved him with affection, because I felt good about him. I hated him, but there was a need in his life and I saved it. That's, that's agape love. However, Agape love must be coupled, at least in the church of Jesus Christ, with another kind of love, which is an emotional love. Brotherly affection is one word in the Greek, and every one of you know this word because it's a city in Pennsylvania. 
Philadelphia. It means brotherly affection. Not just brotherly love, brotherly affection. It is one of the emotional loves. Outdo one another in showing honor. And Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Virtue with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. There's that Philadelphia word again. And brotherly affection with agape kind of love. Brotherly love is affectionate. How affectionate is it? Well, five times in the New Testament, we're commanded to greet one another with a holy kiss. Man, that's, that's a lot of smooching going on there. <laughs> My point is this. Is it even if you're not comfortable doing that, like Fred used for, did, did not want to do a lip lock on me this morning. <laughs> Germs. <laughs> Our, <laughs> the way that we love each other, both in the way we respond to one another's needs and how we affectionately relate to one another ought to be obvious to the people outside that we love each other differently in the body of Christ than they do. So I ask again, do you love the saints? So we said earlier that we should love not in speech or word only, but in deeds and truth. So how do we show one another love? What are we commanded to do? for one another that is reflective that we really do love one another. These are the one another commands, and I'm not going to show you every one of them, but I'm going to spend some time on them. And as we go through these, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, I want you to ask yourself, how can I do this kind of one another thing to my brother or sister if I do not spend time with them on Sunday mornings and even during the week? If I have no interaction with Christians, if all my time is spent with my unbelieving family and my unbelieving friends, how in the world can I fulfill these very many love one another commands. Jesus says in John chapter 13, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So everybody get your shoes off. Is that what he's talking about? No. And you can tell by the context of that he presents, I'm, I'm the Lord, I'm the master here in the room. And in that culture, when you entered somebody's house, they made sure that your feet were washed as a way of refreshing you. And they always chose the lowest of the servants or the least of the sons or daughters to do this. And Jesus said, if I who am Lord over you, am doing this for you because this is a need that I see and nobody else has bothered to do it, you guys ought to humble yourselves to wash one another's feet. And let me tell you why we don't. And Paul addresses this in Philippians chapter 2. It's because we consider ourselves above. We do not consider other people more important than we, but less important. And this is why we do not fall on our knees and submit ourselves to serving one another in the way that God has enabled us to do. This is all about being servant-hearted. This has nothing to do with feet. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul says, through love. Do you love the saints? 
through love be servants of one another. In the Roman Empire, there would be a situation where a master would get saved. And so would his slaves. And the slave who had the gift of teaching might be an elder in the church. And guess what? The master submits to his slave because his slave is presenting God's word. We need to be submissive to serve one another. And the only way that that can take place is if you count others to be more important than yourself. Because when we don't do it, we're saying your needs don't matter. If you say that, are you loving the saints? What else are we commanded to do for one another? Live in harmony with one another. Now, there are people in this room that can sing, but they don't read music. There are people in this room that are musical, and they can read music. And there are people who have sung in choirs or in musical groups. And you have sung what we call harmony. And if you sing harmony, you have to listen to what your neighbor's singing, and the note that you're assigned must blend with their note, even though it's a different note. And this is difficult to do sometimes, especially for the prima donnas who want to be heard, and they're just a supportive note in the choir. Any Lawrence Welk fans in here besides me? Okay. Watched Lawrence Welk yesterday, at least what I could get after I got home from the store. But uh, even before I was married the first time, I loved watching Lawrence Welk because I liked listening to Guy and Ralna. Do you remember Guy and Ralna? Good looking couple. Everybody wanted to be Guy. All the girls wanted to be Ralna and they wanted a marriage like Guy and Ralna's. And when they sung together and looked at each other, you thought, oh, I want to have a marriage like that. And they blended so well. And as the years went by, when they sang together, it sounded like they were fighting each other. And the next thing you know, they're divorced. Folks, it was said of Frank Sinatra that when he sang with backup singers, that he would adjust his volume, his tone, and even his vibrato to match the people with whom he is singing. And we as Christians need to learn how to do that, to live in harmony with one another. All right? Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. What else are we commanded to do for one another, to demonstrate that we love the saints? We bear one another's burdens. Sometimes a person will have a physical burden, a financial burden. And when we respond to that, we are loving the saints. We are laying our lives down for them. It may just be a portion of our lives. I may be just laying down a portion of my bank account, a portion of my pantry food, a portion of my time, a portion of whatever, but I am laying down a portion of my life and I need to be prepared to lay down my whole life if I need to because that's how we love one another. What else are we commanded to do? speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Now, you can't do that unless there's another Christian in the room. When we come together on Sunday mornings, we do this, don't we? You know who does this whenever he's with a Christian? 
this Richard fellow over here, he's got a song that'll come to mind and he'll start singing it no matter what we're talking about in the Bible. He's got it. He is always doing that. In Colossians 3.16, Paul says, the word of Christ, that is the Bible, must dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. We need to be teaching and admonishing one another. Everybody thinks that I'm the teacher in the church. No, all of you are teachers in the church. And all of us, even I, need to be reminded of basic Christian truths because I could get discouraged or I could wander off into sin. So we are teaching and admonishing one another. And this is connected to our relationship to the scripture. If you don't know the scriptures, how are you going to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly and teach and admonish one another? In addition to that, you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs based on the word of Christ that dwells in us richly. What else are we commanded to do to demonstrate that we love the saints? We comfort one another with these words. I had a sign in my office up in Vermont that said, so this isn't home sweet home. Adjust. Get over it. No. And the reason I had that is because I was reacting to people that walked around, oh, woe is me, oh, ha, ha, all the time. But there are times when each and every one of us needs some sympathy and some comfort. And we ought to be prepared to do that for one another. But you can't do that. You can't even be aware that somebody needs comfort unless you are hanging around with other Christians and meeting with them. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any incentive of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And here comes the verse that I have kept referring to. Do nothing from selfishness or conceit, but in humility count others as better than yourselves. Now, I don't know who you're going to vote for, Trump or Biden or somebody else, but if your favorite candidate said, I'm coming to your house for dinner tonight, and I'd, I'd like you to make your famous meatloaf. You would consider that person important enough to do it, wouldn't you? Why don't we do that with one another? Why don't we count one another as more important than ourselves? And when you say, I'm not going to respond to that need, you're saying that person isn't worth it to me. Do you love the saints? Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. He has to throw that in because there are some people out there that would just absolutely neglect all of their responsibilities in order to meet somebody else's need. What else are we commanded to do that demonstrates that we love the saints? Encourage one another and build one another up. Okay, now I'm not talking about the Hollywood kind of building up. No. Oh, he's so handsome. You did such a good job. You are marvelous. Oh, I love that dress. This isn't flattery. This isn't a bunch of compliments. When we're talking about building up, we're talking about building one another up in the faith. Our scripture reading was all about that this morning. Building up the church of God. The church of God is people. Are you investing in people with the gifts and abilities that God has given you and your resources to build up the body of Christ to make your neighbor more Christ-like? Each of us has received a gift. Peter says, use it for one another. Do you know why I have been given the gift of teaching? 
It's not for me. It's for you. It's to help make the scriptures clear for you so that you can build one another up in the faith. Why did we receive a spiritual gift? To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit or a spiritual gift for the common good. It's for the good of everybody else in the room. And this is why God gives a variety of spiritual gifts because the body needs more than just teaching, more than just encouragement, more than just giving, more than just faith. We need to confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. Folks, you feel yourself on the edge of falling into sin? Talk to one another. If you spend time with one another, uh, most of you notice that if you've spent any time with me, I'll, I'll share some of uh, the things that I'm just not good at and am and, and really lacking in the Christian life. This is an opportunity for you to pray. But if you don't spend time with me, you're not going to know any of that. Practice hospitality toward one another. <sighs> Without murmuring, this is going to sound awful, but when I get up in the morning and get out of bed and I walk out and turn the coffee maker on and do my push-ups and put my stuff in the toaster oven, I am not dressed And if I have people staying at my house, that means I've got to come out of the bedroom with something on. And I have to be quiet because they might still be sleeping. And this cramps my style. And I'm tempted to murmur and get all bent out of shape about it. But Peter says, practice hospitality with one another without murmuring. There are was a man that I met back in the 80s and only by God's grace are we still friends today because of how I behaved toward him. But uh, he had been uh, fired from a church for teaching the word of God and he and his family needed a place to stay until they got back on their feet again. And uh, somebody told me who also knew him no, if he, you get him in your house, he'll never get out. And, and I told this man he couldn't stay with us. And to this day, I am embarrassed about that. Only a few years later, he invited me over to the church where he was pastoring in Maine to lead the music for a meeting of the uh, Independent Fundamental Churches of America. And he treated us like kings. He was so hospitable toward us, making me feel absolutely ashamed. Hospitality is a great test of love for the saints because it really can cramp our style. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. This goes back to that Philippians chapter 2 passage. And this is why Jesus could stoop to his knees and wash the disciples' feet because he considered that their need was more important than his need to be honored as Lord. And this is why Jesus Christ could die on the cross because he could see that our need, or at least this was his disposition, was more important than his need. What was his need? His need was to come down from that cross, get his wounds attended to, get something to eat and to drink. But he considered that my reconciliation to God the Father was more important than his comfort of getting off the cross. And this is the verse that just kind of sums it all up for us. Let's consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. What does it mean to consider? It means to think about. Have you ever just sat down and thought, 
how can I be an encouragement to my brothers and sisters at Oak Grove Baptist Church? Do you, I don't know how many of you talk to Billy Bowling much, but I try to call her maybe once or twice a month. But in the past few years, she has been taking it upon herself to call me to tell me how much she appreciates me. She's been sitting around thinking, how can I be an encouragement to somebody at Oak Grove Baptist Church? So she's been considering how to stir up one another to love and good works. How can you do that if you don't meet with other Christians or have contact with them? And so Paul, or the author to Hebrews says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some because you can't stir up one another to love and good works if you do but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near, friends, it's always best to think maybe today. Maybe today my Lord will come for me. Maybe today my Jesus I will see. And what have I done for him today? How have I ministered to my brothers and sisters? Because you cannot love God without loving one another. Because if you don't love one another, John tells us you don't love God. You see that fella? There's nothing wrong with fishing, and there's nothing wrong with going to on a fishing tournament a couple times a year. So I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but he's out there every Sunday morning. He's not meeting with the saints. In fact, he walks by the church to get his boat out into the water. How many of these one another commands can he fulfill if he is not spending time with the saints, he can't. Does he love the saints? Well, they hurt my feelings. They did me wrong. Well, you love yourself because we all do one another wrong. You, you know what that is? Any idea? That's a liver. Now, where's that liver? It's in the hands of that doctor. What good is that liver doing the human body? None whatsoever. God didn't make us a bunch of organs so the liver could live over here and the heart here and the lungs over there. He designed the body to work together in proximity. This is where the body analogy or metaphor comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I'm going to insert some words to help you understand for just as the human body is one body and but it has many members and all the members of the human body though they are many are one body so it is with not with Christ we're not talking about Christ's human body. So it is with the body of Christ, which is a euphemism for the church of Jesus Christ. So it is with the church of Jesus Christ or the body of Christ. For by one Holy Spirit, we all were baptized. This is what the baptizing ministry is. Into one body. The baptizing ministry and the Holy Spirit places us into the universal, invisible, true church of Jesus Christ. Jews are Greek, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body of Christ does not consist of one member, but of many. God has so arranged or composed this church, this body, giving the greater honor to the inferior part, so that one part can't say, oh, you're nothing, we can do without you. I'm better than you. That there may be no discord in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. 
This is in the context of spiritual gifts. Each of you has a special ability from the Holy Spirit to contribute to the growth of Oak Grove Baptist Church. You can't say, well, because I'm not a teacher, I'm not important. Or because I am a teacher, I'm more important than you. No, we all have the same care for one another. We're all necessary. If I take out your liver, where are you going to be? You're going to be dead. In the passage that we read from Ephesians chapter 4, it says when each part is working properly, that's each spiritual gift, the body upbuilds itself in growth. Want to grow? We all have to do what we have been designed by God to do. So what is your relationship to the saints? Do you love the saints? Well, how do you know if you love the saints? It'll be demonstrated in what you do for the saints. So, what do you do for the saints? Are you willing to go home this afternoon, get in a rocking chair and say, what do I do for my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you long for the saints? Sometimes all Debbie Bowling can talk about is how much time, how she loves spending time with all of you. Really? Remember this, when we talked about the relationship to Scripture? If you are not longing for his word in this life, do you really think that's going to change after you die? In the same way, with love. If you are not eager to join with believers in this life, do you really think that's going to change when you die? No, it will not. 